HVAC 360 is brought to you today by the Summer School of Hard Knocks. Failing some life courses? Need to get caught up? Well, you're in luck. The Summer School of Hard Knocks is open and accepting applications. Need a course catalog? No, you don't, you sissy. All our courses are self-study, with lessons and corrections passed back to you by Professor I Don't Give a Damn in the form of a swift kick to your backside. Sign up today. Remember, the Summer School of Hard Knocks, where you only fail if you quit. Hey, what's up? Welcome back. This is episode number 93. Matt Nelson here, your host for HVAC 360, helping you go further and faster in the field of HVAC. This podcast is dedicated to you, and we share stories, interview industry experts, and help you add some goodies to your HVAC lunchbox. Um, if you're interested in what we're talking about here, I implore you to go to HVAC360.com and sign up for our list, which is a growing community where every Friday I send some more information, some tips, some tricks, uh, some games we play. So definitely worth you going there and checking it out. So what's up for this week? Well, I wanted to share one of my uh, favorite steps in putting together, or at least my first step in putting together a ductwork layout. Uh, this is what I refer to as the ceiling sandwich. And we'll get to what that is after a brief word from our sponsor. All right, so giving you a little bit of background, uh, a little bit about who I am, packing up cars for vacations and making a lot of things fit into a little space, you know, has always been a point of pride to me. Um, one of my, so to speak, superpowers. Um, if you needed somebody to put five pounds or 10 pounds of stuff in a five pound bag, I'm your man. And this is really often what we are called to do as engineers. Um, but without a good plan, uh, you can get yourself into some trouble real fast. So one method that I've used in the past is what I call the ceiling sandwich. I don't know if that's an official naming convention, but you know, it's mine. Um, so why do we need to do it? First of all, um, laying out ductwork is really nice to know. It's nice to know what your minimum and or and or standard depth is uh, for your ductwork when you're going ahead and, and selecting the different sizes. Is it going to be 10 inches? Is it going to be 12 inches? Is it going to be 16, 18 inches? What's the minimum depth that, you, that you're looking? Um, and with most tasks, you really don't want to do this twice. Uh, so you want to be able to find out um, the first time if it's going to fit, will it fit? You don't want to wait until the installation phase and have the contractor call up and say, hey, you know what? These aren't fitting. Um, not that it would get that far because they'd probably catch it in coordination drawings, but you really don't want to, you, you want to put some thought into it. Now, I know with the advent of, uh, you know, the building information modeling, BIM modeling and drawing and things like that, and all this information going into your drawings, it really, you know, I think it allows engineers to become a little bit lazy and use it as a crutch. Um, doing the ceiling sandwich method is not really a lengthy process. And I think it's still, it, it allows you some great insight and understanding, especially as a young engineer, to able to identify trouble spots rather than relying on the interface check in the software program. Remember, um, it's a, always remember, garbage in, garbage out. So if you don't know what's going in, you don't know what's going out, you may not necessarily have certain areas flagged for you when really they are still trouble spots. So uh, and, you know, I mean, and it could not be it, your fault at all. Maybe it's maybe it's the architect. Maybe it's a structural engineer. Maybe it's other people that will make you look bad. So you need to be able to take control of this area of your design and um, just go through it thoroughly. At least, you know, it, it gives you something to have as a talking point to, you know, the architect, structural, uh, whoever you're going to be talking to, to kind of discuss um, being able to fit something in the ceiling. So ultimately, you want to start with a blank piece of paper. What you're going to end up doing is you're going to end up looking or making something that looks more or less like an architectural section. Um, the first step that I always do is obviously you need to get the floor to floor height. Um, careful here because floors or the floor to floor height may change 
um, depending on what floor you are. I mean, it's it's not consistent. It's not always the same from the first floor to the second floor to the third floor. Um, you know, when you get into a high rise, obviously you're going to get to some point, you know, a multi-story building where it's the floor to floor is going to be the same, but a lot of us don't deal with that. Uh, sometimes you get a basement section that's going to be a different than the first floor section and the second floor section. So all three floor to floors could be potentially different, um, especially when you're having an addition and it's trying to line up to an existing building. Things can get kind of funky because architects um, will, you know, just basically play with the numbers to make things work. And, and this is, you know, for various reasons, whether it's, you know, sight lines or it looks looks as they want it to look a certain way or they need certain um ada uh levels they can't get they can't change the elevation too fast because they need to put a ramp in um so there's various different factors um and again i think the best place to get this information to start your ceiling sandwich is going to be the architectural sections because they are doing and thinking through all these different processes all right for step two um on those structural, on those architectural drawings, you're going to be able to get a slab thickness. So get the slab thickness. So you got the floor to floor, get the slab thickness. Uh, the beam depth is the next thing you'd want. And I wouldn't get that from the architectural drawings. I'd go over to your structural buddy. You do have a structural buddy, don't you? And they're going to be able to help you out, identify major and minor beams as far as what the steel structure of a project is. Now, um, they'll be able to get you the right beam depth. Um, can you go in between the beams? Yeah, but I would kind of reserve that as a uh, last resort. Um, you're going you're gonna to need that eventually, but you want to be able to pick a, a depth that you're going to be able to clear the major beams uh, through a structure and be able to kind of, you know, go around that way. You don't want a lot of transitions up and down. Again, that's going to add to your static pressure drop um, of the unit. So uh, once you get the beam depths, um, and I guess a uh, inspection tip here for you, um, the beams tend to be, especially uh, some of the minor beams that you're going to see, they're going to be like five foot on center. Um, and if you look up into the ceiling and you see uh, whether it's piping, whether it's ductwork, and you want to know if the, they're, they're properly supported, you, know, you can actually see, okay, if it's every other uh, every other beam that they're supported on, typically that's going to be 10 feet. So you can kind of, you know, just like a ceiling grid, you know, two by four, you can kind of identify how big a room is. You can identify how, what the distance is between pipe and duct supports by taking a look at the structural grid, because that's laid out on a, uh, typically on a five foot, uh, five foot center to center. Not always, but you know, it's, it's a good tip. So, um, if it's something that's different, you know, highlight it, but uh, use it for what you want. Um, ceiling heights. Ceiling heights is the next thing that you're going to be looking at. So go back to the architectural different set, different series of architectural plans. You're going to take a look at the, uh, the ceiling grid. And on that ceiling grid, you're going to be able to identify what the, uh, the bottom of that grid, where the ceiling is put. Now, of course, ceilings vary whether it's a lay-in ceiling whether it's a drywall ceiling um, they're going to be different they're going to have different thicknesses they're going to have different support structure so whatever that number is uh, remember that it the ceiling isn't just a line it has dimension just like everything else so you're going to need to know exactly how thick that is um, and, and and things like that obviously you want to be able to identify that too and keep in mind keep in the back of your mind um, when you're laying out equipment um, is there accessibility issues you know are you are you um, are you putting equipment above a drywall ceiling which requires access panels and is generally a, a you know a pain in the butt so you don't want to uh, you don't want to do that um you want to also identify areas that have like uh unusually high ceilings um so that is something uh because you know too you're not going to locate equipment you know way up there even even access valves um anything anything put in that ceiling space becomes difficult um even if the say you for instance just to keep the floor to floor floor to floor height um, or the uh, the ceiling height at like nine feet but all of a sudden you have this you know six foot ceiling space uh, you're you're not going to want to put anything you want to keep everything right 
as close to the ceiling grid as possible because when anybody, you know, this works back to maintenance. When everybody is going to try to, you know, access that and maintain that, they're going to get a ladder, they're going to go up, they're going to pop a ceiling tile or an access panel, and then they're going to, you know, if, if it's right there, they can reach their hands up or maybe get their shoulders through the ceiling grid and it's and work on it, and that's fine. But if it's way up there, then there's some deconstruction that needs to happen. And you as well, you well, you... You, you probably know as well as I do that ceiling deconstruction doesn't happen all that often. They will just leave it until it fails, and that is bad news. So do your due diligence and identify those issues and, and kind of get them in the, the right area. All right, step four, uh, we have lighting. You can't forget lighting. Obviously, ceilings have thicknesses. Lights obviously have thicknesses. Um, you're going to have your standard, you know, lay in two by four light troffer, um, you know, in, in typical office buildings. Uh, you will also have can lights, some hi hats uh, that will also be put in ceiling tiles. Um, those are, you know, they all have depth. Um, they all, the hi hats are, are particular, uh, of particular issue, especially if they, want to put them in corridors some of your biggest ducks you typically run like to run in corridors so if you have these high hats going up and these could be like you know six inches eight inches well actually more i would t typically say eight to ten inches um they actually may end up getting into your duck work um which isn't a problem you can pocket that out but i mean you just don't want to do that you kind of want to leave that as a last resort you don't want to have to do anything to your duck work you want to have it you know clear and free um, you know, the, that way there's no kind of, you know, extra coordination that needs to take place because extra coordination could go bad, could go good. It could not happen. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that that happen there. So just make sure that you coordinate uh, with your lights. Um, also, you know, I mean, if you're if if remember that if it's in a lay in grid, if you have a two by four troffer that's going in a lay in grid, it has to go over the over the grid ceiling and into the grid um and what i mean by that is it's usually not built in place it usually is 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 set there uh, you know maybe it is if, if if it's if it's hung off the ceiling but you have to be able to kind of remove that so you have to be able to lift it up out of there so you have to actually you can't just take the top of the light fixture if you're if you're doing the depth you have to add some extra space for it to be able to to move or sometimes you know you have the uh, you know the wire whip the electrical connection coming off the back side of the um of the light so that might be in the way there's all these different things you got to take into account all right and step five, factor in the duct thickness. All right, you know, when you're drawing your duct, it's not just a square dimension. It actually needs to be supported. You're going to have flanges there. You're going to have insulation. Um, you're going to need, you know, additional supports to support the duct work, you know, from the structure. So those all, you know, those all take depth. Um, typically, you know, I've always used, depending on the size of your ductwork, and, and this will vary. If you have large ductwork, it might be more than this. If it's small ductwork, it might be less than that. If you're using round, it might be something, you might be able to use a strap, and it might be something completely different. So all these kind of depend. Um, but usually, if you have medium-sized square ductwork, two inches around the duct is a good size um, to be able to count for all the miscellaneous things. So that's two inches above and two inches below. Um, but, you know, I mean, when you're trying to fit something in a tight space, you know, sometimes that that extra four inches above and below is a lot to ask. Um, so step six, you want to set your minimum or preferred depth for your ducts. So you can so you can go straight, um, you know, and a lot of times when you're setting this up, you know, say you're in an office building, office building, you know, it's going to be the same uh, ceiling height. Everywhere it's going to be a lay-in ceiling. You're going to have everything's going to be roughly, you know, very similar. So you might only have to do one of these ceiling sandwiches, but you you might have to do more if your building or project is a little bit more complex. Um, so once you step the, set that in step six, step seven is really looking for trouble areas. Um, beams tend to be bigger around shafts. Um, do you have any specialty ceilings that that you need to either account for or avoid? Are there areas where you have tight ceilings? Um, 
uh, these are you know just different areas and you know what do you do when you have to cross ducks you know this is where okay I didn't use that uh, space in between the beams now I can use that to, to cross duck work um, so that's one of the things that you want to reserve for that last date or can you you know I mean in your layout can you actually avoid crossing your ducks you know that's the the best of both worlds um, and obviously plumbing you know plumbing line coordination you need to be um, there with your plumber, uh, plumbing lines. And, and, and I guess, you know, I guess things to keep in mind, ceilings tend to be tight. Um, there's not a lot of space. Architects like to push the ceiling about as high as they can. Uh, so it, they always, they are, they're always tight. You don't get extra space typically in a ceiling. Um, mechanical ductwork, really uh just to remember that that in the construction projects process the mechanical contractor typically leads the as-built coordination drawings they're the first ones um they have the background they put the uh, ductwork layout on the drawings and they're the first ones typically to get installed um that doesn't mean that they get to hog everything they got they need to respect the plumber and again getting back to the plumbing lines plumbing plumbing lines need to pitch they need to have pitch and they they're not forgiving. It's not like you can like, like a beam pocket where you can kind of, you know, take a piece of piece uh, of the duct out or make a transition and it's OK. No, it has everything has to flow downhill. Uh, otherwise, you've got to go through, you know, I mean, could you make it work? Yeah, but it's really the, the cost just goes through the roof. So you need to, the, the mechanical contractor needs to respect the plumber um, and every, uh, every other trade, really, but especially the plumber. I mean, obviously, you got to share the road, you got to share the ceiling, kind of same concept here. Um, you got to be concerned about your depth of equipment. You know, I mean, once you lay out the dock work, um, what is the equipment that's going in the ceiling space? Those typically are going to be uh, larger than uh, your ductwork sizes, uh, VAV boxes, maybe not so much. Maybe you get in the VAV boxes tend to be around, you know, the, the, the 10 to 12 inches, um, range. So those can, you know, those can fit real well. Do you have larger pieces of equipment that need to fit in there? Um, you need to be able to take that and you need to be able to coordinate that with architects. Um, ultimately, if there's a space where you, you, you end up drawing your ceiling sandwich and you go, I just can't make this work, um, you know, for reasons such as the uh, my aspect ratio. My aspect ratio is getting ridiculous. It ends up being like six to one, and that's that's not okay. It needs to be it needs to be four to one. It needs to be two to one. So you go back to the architect and you say, "Hey, I can't live with the ceiling at this height. It can't be nine feet. Can I go eight six? Will six inches be enough?" Um, and remember, in these negotiate, negotiations, make sure you've thought through all these different things of equipment and sizes. And you don't want to just just like you don't want to do things multiple times. The architect doesn't want to have to reset the ceiling height multiple times um, because that affects things, you know, especially in section. If they're doing bulkheads, if they're doing, you know, different sort of uh, soffits that need to account for the varying ceiling heights. Is it just going to look wonky? Um, you know, is it, is it something that, hey, you know what, they really can't give you any space in these particular areas. There are certain areas that you kind of learn, you know, some, some of the areas that are kind of in the background, around the shaft, things like that, that they can kind of, you know, fudge things, um, you know, but there's ultimately there's a minimum ceiling that you have to you know, that you have to have, you know, it's just going to be, it's just going to be too claustrophobic if you get down to, you know, close to seven feet. I mean, if you think about a seven foot ceiling, that's, 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 ins you know, that's insane. You can, you know, touch that. Most people can just touch that with their hand and that's way too close. So, you know, there's things that, that you need to identify early if this, you know, floor to floor height doesn't work with the ceiling height, doesn't work with your duct work. If these things aren't working together, you need to be able to identify this early in the process. And again, since this is a quick and easy process just to kind of go through and identify, um, you need to have this discussion early and you need to be able to solve it once. Don't, don't keep dropping the ceiling height. Um, you know, sometimes that happens when we, you know, live with reality in the installation world, uh, where you end up dropping it, you know, an inch, two inches. Um, typically you don't, you don't do that 
kind of incremental change um, when you're in design. So you'd be able to kind of go through your whole design process, negotiate with the architects once, and and figure that out. I mean, sometimes if you have to, especially if you have to bring the structural engineer back in to say, hey, you know what, this beam depth just isn't working for me. Can we change it? Um, that's a big deal. So one last thing, if you can at all um, run round duct work, in your ceiling space, um, just remember: can you can you like if you're if you're running it out to a diffuser, um, can you actually turn that ninety? Can you turn a ninety in the ceiling space? Because obviously that that ninety is going to be more than just the dimension of that ductwork. So um, that's going to be you know and kind of like what we talked last last week. You know, if you turn that ninety, is that going to compress? Usually that's a flex duct. Are you going to compress that flex duct so you can add? additional static to it so does that does that fit properly all right so that's my uh, seven steps and a couple of tips to creating a ceiling sandwich so that's a wrap for this week i appreciate your time um thanks for listening uh if this was helpful obviously share it with somebody who's learning duct design um and as i mentioned at the top of the show please subscribe to my list at hvac360.com um be part of that growing community of aggressive learners like I know you are. Um, and if you are, if you, if you, I would also appreciate if you can give me a rating on iTunes, um, any sort of rating, uh, any sort of review. If you give me a review, I'm going to give you a shout out on the show. So that's it for this episode of HVAC 360. I'm Matt Nelson, helping you go further and faster in the field of HVAC. And as always, know what you build and share what you know.